Hormone therapy is an effective treatment for prostate cancer. It's good at controlling the disease and also lowering PSA. However, it does have some sometimes severe side effects and those side effects affect quality of life. And when men are prescribed hormone therapy, they're oftentimes put on it for 18 to 24 months or even for life. Now, there is intermittent hormone therapy, which has 10 to 20 year data showing that's effective. And how intermittent hormone therapy works is you go on hormone therapy, you get the PSA under control, so it basically it becomes undetectable after a certain amount of time, and then you go on a holiday. So you come off hormone therapy, you allow the, allow the testosterone to come back, and you see what the PSA does. And if the PSA begins to rise, you go back on hormone therapy again. Now, even though there's 10 to 20 year data showing that intermittent hormone therapy is very effective as a treatment for prostate cancer, it's still not widespread all around the world. We're seeing men continuously put on hormone therapy. So today, Dr. Scholz, who's a 30 year medical oncologist who focuses solely in prostate cancer, is gonna discuss the ins and outs of intermittent hormone therapy and also how you can talk to your doctor about it. So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about intermittent hormone therapy. And we had a previous video that we just did about a couple days ago. And in the New England Journal of Medicine, they did a, published the results of a five-year study where they took a thousand men and they broke them into three different groups. The first group got first-generation hormone therapy as a monotherapy. The second group got a second-generation hormone therapy as a monotherapy. And then the third group got the combination of both. And in the video, we talked about the impact of having a second-generation therapy right away when you're about to start hormone therapy. Now, the interesting thing about the study is that they did it in a fashion of intermittent hormone therapy. So can you explain it, explain to the patients what intermittent hormone therapy is? When they design these clinical trials, they want to use what would be considered a state-of-the-art methodology so that if the premise of the trial pans out and is confirmed, no one can, no one can criticize that, oh, this is an old-fashioned way of thinking, and even though the medicine work, we don't use it in that methodology any longer. Instead of giving these people five years of continuous hormone th therapy, they gave them uh, the hormone treatment for about nine months or so, and if the PSA levels dropped down to undetectable levels, then they could take a holiday. When the holiday ensued, that means that the hormone treatment was stopped, testosterone levels were allowed to return, PSA levels would rise, and as a result, once that PSA reached a certain threshold, it had to be, uh, the treatment had to be restarted. And so they set a threshold of a PSA of around two to five, and then hormone therapy would be reinitiated. And of course, uh, in most cases, as we know from intermittent therapy experience, the PSA would go back down to zero again. And so the patients were not given continuous hormone treatment for five years. They were given intermittent hormone therapy for five or more years. It was actually an average of five years follow-up in the study. So there was a number of patients who were on treatment for more than five years. The point being that the methodology of giving intermittent treatment was not criticized in any way by people reviewing these, this article. This was considered state-of-the-art, standard methodology for giving hormone treatment to people with relapsed prostate cancer. The idea of stopping effective treatment when someone's cancer has responded well is, not, is counterintuitive. Uh, this is a concept that when it first came out 20 or more years ago, it was uh, criticized and people argued that this would cause cancer to progress more quickly and possibly lead to higher mortality rates. Uh, so large clinical trials were designed to look at the 10-year uh, outcomes of giving treatment intermittently versus continuously. And all the quality studies showed that there was no difference in 10-year outcomes, uh, but there was an improvement in quality of life. Before I get to my next question, if these videos have helped you, please click that subscribe button. When you do so, it's helping push these videos to other people who are also searching for answers in prostate cancer. And these people are all around the world. So by clicking that subscribe button, you are joining our cause. Another way you can join our cause is if you would like to donate, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my questions on intermittent hormone therapy. So it's interesting because the study was done in recurrent men with high risk disease. So it's not like they're even doing this type of intermittent hormone therapy in people who have maybe a Gleason 7 disease. It's, it's in the people who have already had a recurrence of some sort after surgery or radiation. So with that being said, 
I think normal practices today, intermittent therapy isn't extremely popular. You know, we don't see this as a widespread practice, but the New England Journal of Medicine, as you said, is now saying this is state of the art science. So how is inter like hormone therapy given? And then what would you like to see happen? The one issue about stopping effective treatment in men with prostate cancer is first and foremost, these patients should be in what we call a complete remission. It's not something you're going to uh, implement in someone who's had a partial remission. Let's say their PSA went down from 10 down to 2. You say, well, that's progress. Can I take a holiday now? No. Uh, the fact that there's still some PSA production indicates that the hormone therapy has not completely controlled the disease. And that type of an individual probably needs to be looking at layering on some additional treatment. But many men do go into a complete remission. Their PSA becomes undetectable. Now we have PSMA PET scans. The PET scan should show disappearance of all active disease. And in those individuals, uh, the thought of stopping treatment and allowing testosterone to come back is a very plausible, well-tested and, uh, and validated treatment approach. So when we talk about PSA, you know, you're a 30-year medical oncologist focusing solely in prostate cancer, and you have treated thousands of men with hormone therapy. So in this study, they're letting the PSA go up to two. Is that something that you would do in your practice? Yeah, some of the intermittent trials would allow PSAs to go up to 10 or 20. Uh, we felt a little uncomfortable with that. So uh, allowing the PSA to rise up to two is a very plausible number. However, this trial that we are talking about can't factor in the advent of these new PSMA PET scans. So another possible hidden benefit of doing intermittent therapy is finding out where the residual cancer is and perhaps eradicating it with spot radiation. An additional argument for intermittent therapy these days, beyond the fact that it, your quality of life is going to be better if you have testosterone back, is discovering where the latent disease may be lurking and then going after it once the testosterone comes up and the disease becomes visible on a PSMA PET scan. So if the PSA is allowed to rise up even to one, in most cases we will find out where the offending cancer is located in the body and then an expert radiation therapy doctor can, can uh, zap it and eradicate it. So that hasn't been studied in prospective clinical trials yet as to whether or not that concept is advantageous seems likely that it will be advantageous. The good news also is that modern spot radiation is typically harmless in terms of its uh, repercussions and, uh, and side effects. So there doesn't seem to be too much downside to this idea. And we are starting to see some patients because we started using PET scans, PSMA PET scans, four or more years ago on a research basis where some of these patients who are having salvage radiation for these spots that are detected during the holiday period with a PET scan are remaining in durable remission. So it seems like maybe some of these patients who would have had to cycle off and on hormone therapy the rest of their life by finding out where the cancer is and eradicating it, that they can stay off the hormone therapy at least for a longer period and possibly indefinitely. Since the study mentions, you know, they put people on hormone therapy for nine months, is that something you would do before you would allow somebody to take a holiday? Yeah, I think that's a nice compromise. Uh, some of the centers have used six months, some have used 12 months. Uh, some have argued that once the PSA becomes undetectable, plus a month or two. But if you look at all those things, it sort of shakes out at around eight to nine months as an initial course. Uh, if the PSA has not become undetectable within eight months or so, then that's not a good sign. That's what we call a high PSA nadir. And those individuals need to go a completely different direction. And we need to figure out why the hormone therapy hasn't gotten them into a complete remission. And as I mentioned before, probably layer on some additional treatment to get them into a complete remission. So how often would you test for PSA during the time of the hormone therapy? And how often would you test during the intermittent holiday part? Well, at least initially, people are curious. We'll check PSA monthly when they're starting on treatment. And when we're discontinuing treatment, we'll check PSA and of course we check testosterone as well. We want to see how the body recovers uh, every three months. In the previous video, we talked about that there are different types of second generation hormone therapies and that, you know, they have slight differences as far as a side effect profile goes. So does that matter what type of hormone therapy, whether first generation, second generation combination when you're doing intermittent hormone therapy as far as testosterone recovery or side effects? Well, in terms of testosterone recovery, it makes a huge difference. Slow recovery of testosterone after typical LH 
RH agonist treatment, uh, Lupron, Eligar, Trelstar, Solidex, and others, uh, that this, the recovery of testosterone can be rather slow. And if men are going on longer treatment periods, for example, if you give a nine-month course of treatment, testosterone in a 60-year-old will probably recover after three or four months. In a 75-year-old, it may be six to eight months. Newer medicines, such as Orgovix, which has a more predictable testosterone recovery when it's discontinued, is an interesting proposition. And also, the second-generation hormone treatments uh, tend to have quicker recovery if they're used without Lupron. So that has to be balanced out with the fact that when uh, people get Lupron and a second-generation hormone treatment, that is, according to the study that you talked about, we talked about in the other video, is the most efficacious treatment. So if we're looking for maximum killing effect, we do want a first and a second generation hormone therapy. If people have the insurance coverage for Orgovix, which uh, has a more predictable uh, testosterone recovery when it's discontinued, that might be more attractive so that when the holiday period ensues, that you do indeed get your testosterone back in a timely fashion. Speaking of insurance, have you seen issues when it comes to intermittent hormone therapy that maybe they had coverage, they went on a holiday and they came back to take the second generation again and they're not being covered? Is that ever a, a situation? Never been an issue with the first generation medicines. With the second generation medicines, typically not, but it could be an issue at times as Patients, uh, since these medicines are so expensive, will oftentimes get uh, consideration from the manufacturer, and uh, this is something that uh, is completely at the discretion of the manufacturer, whether they want to discount the cost of the medicines. Uh, then they'll, they'll sign them up for a year, and then it has to be renewed on an annual basis. There's some hoops that people have to go through to get these new, newer second generation medicines uh, because they're so very, very expensive. One of the questions that I get asked often is, if I'm going to go ahead and be on, they're already gonna be on a first generation, then they're gonna go on a second generation hormone therapy. Out of the different types of second generations, um, if I'm gonna go on a holiday, do my side effects stop right away? Is there one that would make my side effects stop faster? How does that work? Well, the good news is that with the second generation, there's four of them, Zytiga, Xtandi, Erlita, and Nubeca. They don't contribute to the slow recovery of testicular testosterone production the way that the first generation medicines do. So I don't think it makes much difference in terms of recovery. A slow recovery of testosterone is something we've lived with for a long time. And it should be mentioned, the idea of giving these men that have slow recovery some testosterone if after, say, three to six months, their, uh, their own testicular production of testosterone is lagging. I've heard a number of doctors, uh, when they find out that we're suggesting such things, you know, they're, oh, we're throwing gasoline on the, on the fire, uh, is a common comment that I think that doesn't make much sense when you think about it because the testosterone chemically that comes from the testicles is identical to the testosterone that's uh, provided in pharmaceutical uh, venues. So the idea of giving some testosterone to restore normal levels is the exact same thing we're doing when we stop hormone treatment. That, uh, I guess, just isn't really processed through by some of the practitioners out there and, and or maybe they don't want to deal with the complexities and the uncertainties of a rising PSA after in someone that's had prostate cancer. But for experienced doctors in this realm, it's not really that big a deal once you get past the psychological um, idea that, or, uh, that it is okay to have testosterone recovery. What's the longest duration that you've seen somebody go on intermittent hormone therapy? Like five years, two years? Well, when you talk about being on intermittent therapy, I don't know if you're referring to the, the holiday period after the hormone treatment, or the fact that they've been cycling off and on. The holiday periods in certain cases can be almost indefinite. Um, and and uh, people that have been cycling, I mean, people have been uh, out to 20 years. Estimated time to hormone resistance these days, if someone has started on first and second generation hormone treatment for relapsed disease uh, in a timely fashion, let's say their PSA is less than 10, and then their PSA comes down to undetectable levels on that combination, the median time to that treatment no longer working, that means you give it and the PSA keeps rising, is about 17 or 18 years. The efficacy of combination hormone therapy started in a timely fashion is unbelievably great. So today we talked about intermittent hormone therapy. 
Now, maybe your doctor has never mentioned this to you and you're currently on hormone therapy, or maybe you're about to embark upon going horm on hormone therapy, and this has just not been in the conversation. What you can do is you can print out this article and bring it up to them and find out if they do this, and if not, why? Maybe it's not an option for you, or maybe it is, but it's good to find out. It's good to know why something is an option or why it isn't an option, and that way you can make a game plan going forward. If you have specific questions about your case and you need help developing these questions with your medical team and kind of helping with the conversation, our helpline is a great source for information. They don't give advice, but they do give information. And you can find them at pcri.org forward slash helpline. And, you know, honestly, we really appreciate that you watch these videos. It's really incredible that you trust us as a source of information. It's an honor to be here for you. If you have other questions or topics that you would like us to cover in future videos, please leave them in the comment section below this video. I hope you have a great week and please remember, you are not alone.